Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. So find a comfortable spot, adjust your volume, take a nice deep breath in, let it out slowly, and off we go. Before we begin this evening, I'd like to give a special shout out of thanks to a number of new members of our Patreon, Barbara, Jamie, Dale, Killian, and Tiffany. Thank you all so much for supporting this podcast. Your help makes it possible and it's much appreciated. All of them and everyone else who supports this podcast through Patreon or buymeacoffee.com this month will be eligible for our giveaway to supporters. This month, the prize is an exclusive episode made just for you. And because it's just for you, copyright restrictions do not apply. You'll find links to Patreon and buymeacoffee.com in the show description, and I hope you'll take a moment to check them out. Now, let's get to the reading. I know a lot of you love travel logs, so tonight we're returning to the wintry north with an epic story of adventure. The North Pole, its discovery in 1909 under the auspices of the Perry Arctic Club by Robert E. Perry, with an introduction by Theodore Roosevelt and a foreword by Gilbert H. Grosvenor, director and editor of the National Geographic Society. Originally published in 1910 by Frederick A. Stokes Company. Let's pick up where we left off. Chapter 2. Preparations. A great many persons have asked when I first conceived the idea of trying to reach the North Pole. That question is hard to answer. It is impossible to point to any day or month and to say, then the idea first came to me. The North Pole dream was a gradual and almost involuntary evolution from earlier work in which it had no part. My interest in Arctic work dates back to 1885, when as a young man, my imagination was stirred by reading accounts of explorations by Nordenskjold in the interior of Greenland. These studies took full possession of my mind and led to my undertaking entirely alone a summer trip to Greenland in the following year. Somewhere in my subconscious self, even so long ago as that, there may have been gradually dawning a hope that I might someday reach the pole itself. Certain it is, the lure of the North, the Arctic fever as it has been called, entered my veins then, and I came to have a feeling of fatality, a feeling that the reason and intent of my existence was the solution of the mystery of the frozen fastnesses of the Arctic. But the actual naming of the pole as the object of an expedition did not materialize until 1898, when the first expedition of the Perry Arctic Club went north with the avowed intention of reaching 90 North, if it were possible. Since then, I have made six different attempts in six different years to reach the coveted point. The sledging season, when such a dash is possible, extends from about the middle of February until the middle of June. Before the middle of February, there is not sufficient light, and after the middle of June, there is likely to be too much open water. 
During these six former attempts made by me to win the prize, the successive latitudes of 83 degrees 52 minutes, 84 degrees 17 minutes, and 87 degrees 6 minutes were attained, the last giving back to the United States the record of farthest north, which had for a time been wrested from it by Nansen, and from him in turn by the Duke of the Abruzzi. In writing the story of this last and successful expedition, it is necessary to go back to my return from the former expedition of 1905 to 1906. Before the Roosevelt entered port, and before I reached New York, I was planning for another journey into the North, which, if I could obtain the essential funds and retained my health, I intended to get underway as soon as possible. It is a principle in physics that a ponderable body moves along the line of least resistance, but that principle does not seem to apply to the will of man. Every obstacle which has ever been placed in my way, whether physical or mental, whether an open lead or the opposition of human circumstances, has ultimately acted as a spur to the determination to accomplish the fixed purpose of my life, if I lived long enough. On my return in 1906, great encouragement was received from Mr. Jessup, the president of the Perry Arctic Club, who had contributed so generously to my former expeditions, and in whose honor I had named the northernmost point of land in the world, latitude 83 degrees 39 minutes, Cape Morris Jessup. He said in so many words that he would see me through on another journey north. His promise meant that I should not have to beg all the money in small sums from a more or less reluctant world. The winter of 1906 to 1907 and the spring of 1907 were devoted to presenting to the world the results of the previous undertaking and to the work of interesting friends as far as possible in another expedition. We had the ship, which had cost about $100,000 in 1905, but $75,000 more was needed for new boilers and other changes, for equipment and for operating expenses. While the bulk of the necessary funds was furnished by the members and friends of the Perry Arctic Club, a very considerable amount came from all parts of the country in contributions ranging from $100 to $5 and even $1. These donations were not less appreciated than the big ones because they showed the friendliness and the interest of the givers and demonstrated to me the general recognition of the fact that while the expedition was financed by private individuals, it was in spirit a national affair. At last the funds, actual and promised, were in such amount as to authorize our contracting for new boilers for the Roosevelt, and ordering certain modifications in her structure which would fit her more effectively for another voyage, such as enlarging the quarters forward for the crew, adding a lug sail to the foremast, and changing the interior arrangements somewhat. The general features of the ship had already proved themselves so well adapted for the purpose for which she was intended that no alteration in them was required. Experience had taught me how to figure on delays in the North, but the exasperating delays of ship contractors at home had not yet entered into my scheme of reckoning. Contracts for this work on the Roosevelt were signed in the winter and called for the completion of the ship 
by July 1st, 1907. Repeated oral promises were added to contractual agreements that the work should certainly be done on that date. But as a matter of fact, the new boilers were not completed and installed until September, thus absolutely negating any possibility of going north in the summer of 1907. The failure of the contractors to live up to their word with the consequent delay of a year was a serious blow to me. It meant that I must attack the problem one year older. It placed the initiation of the expedition further in the future with all the possible contingencies that might occur within a year, and it meant the bitterness of hope deferred. On the day when it became lamentably clear that I positively could not sail north that year, I felt much as I had felt when I had been obliged to turn back from 87 degrees 6 minutes, with only the empty bauble farthest north instead of the great prize which I had almost strained my life out to achieve. Fortunately, I did not know that fate was even then clenching her fist for yet another and more crushing blow. While trying to possess my soul in patience despite the unjustified delay, there came the heaviest calamity encountered in all my Arctic work, the death of my friend Morris K. Jessup. Without his promised help, the future expedition seemed impossible. It may be said with perfect truth that to him, more than to any other one man, had been due the inception and the continuance of the Perry Arctic Club and the success of the work thus far. In him we lost not only a man who was financially a tower of strength in the work, but I lost an intimate personal friend in whom I had absolute trust. For a time it seemed as if this were the end of everything, that all the effort and money put into the project had been wasted. Mr. Jessup's death added to the delay caused by the default of the contractors, seemed at first an absolutely paralyzing defeat. Nor was it much help that there was no lack of well-meaning persons who were willing to assure me that the year's delay and Mr. Jessup's death were warnings indicating that I should never find the pole. Yet, when I gathered myself together and faced the situation squarely, I realized that the project was something too big to die, that it never, in the great scheme of things, would be allowed to fall through. This feeling carried me past many a dead center of fatigue and utter ignorance as to where the rest of the money for the expedition was to be obtained. The end of the winter and the beginning of the spring of 1908 were marked by more than one blue day for everybody concerned in the success of the expedition. Repairs and changes in the Roosevelt had exhausted all the funds in the club's treasury. We still needed the money for purchase of supplies and equipment, pay of crew, and running expenses. Mr. Jessup was gone. The country had not recovered from the financial crash of the previous fall. Everyone was poor. Then, from this lowest ebb, the tide turned. Mrs. Jessup, in the midst of her distracting grief, sent a munificent check which enabled us to order essential items of special supplies and equipment, which required time for preparation. General Thomas H. Hubbard accepted the presidency of the club, 
and added a second large check to his already generous contribution. Henry Parrish, Anton A. Raven, Herbert L. Bridgman, the old guard of the club, who had stood shoulder to shoulder with Mr. Jessup from the inception of the organization, stood firm now to keep the organization of the club intact. Other men came forward, and the crisis was passed. But the money still came hard. It was the subject of my every waking thought, and even in sleep it would not let me rest, but followed with mocking and elusive dreams. It was a dogged, dull, desperate time, with the hopes of my whole life rising and falling day by day. Then came an unexpected rift in the clouds, the receipt of a very friendly letter from Mr. Zenas Crane, the great paper manufacturer of Massachusetts, who had contributed to a previous expedition, but whom I had never met. Mr. Crane wrote that he was deeply interested, that the project was one which should have the support of everyone who cared for big things and for the prestige of the country, and he asked me to come to see him, if I could make it convenient. I could, I did. He gave a check for $10,000 and promised to give more if it should be required. The promise was kept, and a little later he accepted the vice presidency of the club. What this $10,000 meant to me at that time would need the pen of Shakespeare to make entirely clear. From this time on, the funds came in slowly but steadily, to an amount that, combined with rigid economy and thorough knowledge of what was and what was not needed, permitted the purchase of the necessary supplies and equipment. During all this time of waiting, a small flood of crank letters poured in from all over the country. There was an incredibly large number of persons who were simply oozing with inventions and schemes, the adoption of which would absolutely ensure the discovery of the pole. Naturally, in view of the contemporaneous drift of inventive thought, flying machines occupied a high place on this list. Motor cars, guaranteed to run over any kind of ice, came next. One man had a submarine boat that he was sure would do the trick though he did not explain how we were to get up through the ice after we had traveled to the pole beneath it. Still another chap wanted to sell us a portable sawmill. It was his enterprising idea that this should be set up on the shore of the central polar sea, and that I was to use it for shaping lumber with which to build a wooden tunnel over the ice of the Polar Sea, all the way to the Pole. Another chap proposed that a central soup station be installed, where the other man would have set up his sawmill, and that a series of hose lines be run thence over the ice, so that the outlying parties struggling over the ice to the Pole could be warmed and invigorated with hot soup from the central station. Perhaps the gem of the whole collection was furnished by an inventor who desired me to play the part of a human cannonball. He would not disclose the details of his invention, apparently lest I should steal it, but it amounted to this. If I could get the machine up there, and could get it pointed in exactly the right direction, and could hold on long enough, it would shoot me to the pole without fail. This was surely a man of one idea, 
He was so intent on getting me shot to the pole that he seemed to be utterly careless of what happened to me in the process of landing there, or of how I should get back. Many friends of the expedition who could not send cash sent useful articles of equipment for the comfort or amusement of the men. Among such articles were a billiard table, various games, and innumerable books. A member of the expedition, having said to a newspaper man a short time before the Roosevelt sailed that we had not much reading matter, the ship was deluged with books, magazines, and newspapers, which came literally in wagon loads. They were strewn in every cabin, in every locker, on the mess tables, on the deck, everywhere. But the generosity of the public was very gratifying, and there was much good reading among the books and magazines. When the time came for the Roosevelt to sail, we had everything which we absolutely needed in the way of equipment, including boxes of Christmas candy, one for every man on board, a gift from Mrs. Perry. It is a great satisfaction to me that this whole expedition, together with the ship, was American from start to finish. We did not purchase a Newfoundland or Norwegian sealer and fix it over for our purposes, as in the case of other expeditions. The Roosevelt was built of American timber in an American shipyard, engined by an American firm with American metal, and constructed on American designs. Even the most trivial items of supplies were of American manufacture. As regards personnel, almost the same can be said. Though Captain Bartlett and the crew were Newfoundlanders, the Newfoundlanders are our next-door neighbors and essentially our first cousins. This expedition went north in an American-built ship by the American route, in command of an American, to secure, if possible, an American trophy. The Roosevelt was built with a knowledge of the requirements of Arctic navigation, gained by the experience of an American on six former voyages into the Arctic. I was extremely fortunate in the personnel of this last and successful expedition, for in choosing the men, I had the membership of the previous expedition to draw from. A season in the Arctic is a great test of character. One may know a man better after six months with him beyond the Arctic Circle than after a lifetime of acquaintance in cities. There is a something, I know not what to call it, in those frozen spaces that brings a man face to face with himself and with his companions. If he is a man, the man comes out, and if he is a cur, the cur shows as quickly. First and most valuable of all was Bartlett, master of the Roosevelt, whose ability had been proved on the expedition of 1905 to 1906. Robert A. Bartlett, Captain Bob as we affectionately call him, comes from a family of hardy Newfoundland navigators long associated with Arctic work. He was 33 when we last sailed north. Blue-eyed, brown-haired, stocky and steel-muscled Bartlett, whether at the wheel of the Roosevelt, hammering a passage through the flows, or tramping and stumbling over the ice pack with the sledges, or smoothing away the troubles of the crew, was always the same. 
tireless, faithful, enthusiastic, and true as a compass. Matthew A. Henson, my Negro assistant, has been with me in one capacity or another since my second trip to Nicaragua in 1887. I have taken him with me on each and all of my northern expeditions, except the first in 1886, and almost without exception on each of my farthest sledge trips. This position I have given him primarily because of his adaptability and fitness for the work. Secondly, on account of his loyalty. He has shared all the physical hardships of my Arctic work. He is now about 40 years old and can handle a sledge better and is probably a better dog driver than any other man living except some of the best of the Eskimo hunters themselves. Ross G. Marvin, my secretary and assistant, who lost his life on the expedition. George A. Wardwell, chief engineer. Percy, the steward, and Murphy, the bosun, had all been with me before. Dr. Wolfe, who was the surgeon of the expedition of 1905 to 1906, had made professional arrangements which prevented him from going north again, and his place was taken by Dr. J. W. Goodsell of New Kensington, Pennsylvania. Dr. Goodsell is a descendant of an old English family that has had representatives in America for 250 years. His great-grandfather was a soldier in Washington's army when Cornwallis surrendered, and his father, George H. Goodsell, spent many adventurous years at sea and fought through the Civil War in the Union Army. Dr. Goodsell was born near Leechburg, Pennsylvania in 1873. He received his medical degree from Polt Medical College, Cincinnati, Ohio, and has practiced medicine at New Kensington, Pennsylvania, specializing in clinical microscopy. He is a member of the Homeopathic Medical Society of Pennsylvania and of the American Medical Association. At the time of his departure on the expedition, he was president of the Allegheny Valley Medical Society. His publications include Direct Microscopic Examination as Applied to Preventative Medicine and the Newer Therapy and Tuberculosis and its Diagnosis. As the scope of this expedition was wider than that of the previous ones, contemplating more extensive tidal observations for the United States Coast and Geodetic Survey, and if conditions permitted, lateral sledge trips east to Cape Morris Jessup and west to Cape Thomas Hubbard, I enlarged my field party, as it may be called, and added to the expedition Mr. Donald B. McMillan of Worcester Academy and Mr. George Borup of New York City. McMillan is the son of a sea captain and was born at Provincetown, Massachusetts in 1874. His father's ship sailed from Boston nearly 30 years ago and was never heard from again. His mother died the next year, leaving the son with four other young children. When McMillan was 15 years old, he went to live with his sister at Freeport, Maine, where he was prepared in the local high school to enter Bedoyne College, being graduated from my alma mater in 1898. Like Borup, McMillan excelled in undergraduate athletics, playing halfback on the Bedoyne Varsity 11 and won a place on the track team. From 1898 to 1900, 
He was principal of the Levi Hall School at North Gorham, Maine, going thence to become headmaster of the Latin department at Swarthmore Preparatory School of Swarthmore, Pennsylvania. Here he remained until 1903, when he became instructor in mathematics and physical training at Worcester Academy, Massachusetts, where he remained until he went north with the expedition. He holds the Humane Society Certificate for saving a number of lives some years ago, an exploit which it is difficult to induce him to talk about. George Borup was born at Sing Sing, New York, September 2, 1885. He prepared for Yale at Groton School, where he spent the years from 1889 to 1903, and was graduated from Yale in 1907. At college, he was prominent in athletics, was a member of the Yale track and golf teams, and made a reputation as a wrestler. After his graduation, he spent a year as a special apprentice in the machine shops of the Pennsylvania Railroad Company at Altoona, Pennsylvania. To Captain Bartlett, I left the selection of his officers and men, with the single exception of the chief engineer. The personnel of the expedition, as finally completed when the Roosevelt left Sydney on the 17th of July, 1908, included 22 men as follows. Robert E. Perry, commanding expedition. Robert A. Bartlett, master of the Roosevelt. George A. Wardwell, chief engineer. Dr. J. W. Goodsell, Surgeon. Professor Ross G. Marvin, Assistant. Donald B. McMillan, Assistant. George Borup, Assistant. Matthew A. Henson, Assistant. Thomas Gushu, Mate. John Murphy, Bosun. Banks Scott, Second Engineer. Charles Percy Stewart, William Pritchard, Cabin Boy, John Connors, John Cody, John Barnes, Dennis Murphy, George Percy, Seaman, James Bentley, Patrick Joyce, Patrick Skeens, John Wiseman, Fireman. The supplies for the expedition were abundant in quantity, but not numerous in variety. Years of experience had given me the knowledge of exactly what I wanted and how much of it. The absolutely essential supplies for a serious Arctic expedition are few, but they should be of the best quality. Luxuries have no place in Arctic work. Supplies for an Arctic expedition naturally divide themselves into two classes, those for the sledge work in the field, those for the ship going and returning and in winter quarters. The supplies for sledge work are of a special character and have to be prepared and packed in such a way as to secure the maximum of nourishment with the minimum of weight of bulk and of tear, that is, the weight of the packing. The essentials and the only essentials needed in a serious arctic sledge journey, no matter what the season, the temperature, or the duration of the journey, whether one month or six, are four, pemmican, tea, ship's biscuit, Condensed Milk Pemmican is a prepared and condensed food made from beef, fat, and dried fruits. It may be regarded as the most concentrated and satisfying of all meat foods and is absolutely indispensable in protracted Arctic sledge journeys. 
The food for use on shipboard and in winter quarters comprises standard commercial supplies. My expeditions have been perhaps peculiar in omitting one item, and that is meat. For this important addition to Arctic food, I have always depended on the country itself. Meat is the object of the hunting expeditions of the winter months, not sport as some have fancied. Here are a few of the items and figures on our list of supplies for the last expedition. Flour, 16,000 pounds. Coffee, 1,000 pounds. Tea, 800 pounds. Sugar, 10,000 pounds. Kerosene, 3,500 gallons. Bacon, 7,000 pounds. Biscuit, 10,000 pounds. Condensed milk, 100 cases. Pemmican, 30,000 pounds. Dried fish, 3,000 pounds. And smoking tobacco, 1,000 pounds. Chapter 3 The Start From her birth beside the recreation pier at the foot of East 24th Street, New York, the Roosevelt steamed north on the last expedition, about one o'clock in the afternoon of July 6, 1908. As the ship backed out into the river, a cheer that echoed over Blackwell's Island went up from the thousands who had gathered on the piers to see us off, while the yacht fleet, the tugboats, and the ferry boats tooted their good wishes. It was an interesting coincidence that the day on which we started for the coldest spot on earth was about the hottest which New York had known for years. There were 13 deaths from heat and 72 heat prostrations recorded in Greater New York for that day, while we were bound for a region where 60 below zero is not an exceptional temperature. We started with about 100 guests of the Perry Arctic Club on board the Roosevelt, and several members of the club, including the president, General Thomas H. Hubbard, the Vice President, Zenas Crane, and the Secretary and Treasurer, Herbert L. Bridgman. As we steamed up the river, the din grew louder and louder. The whistles of the powerhouses and the factories, adding their salutations to the tooting of the river craft. At Blackwell's Island, many of the inmates were out in force to wave us goodbye, and their farewells were not the less appreciated because given by men whom society had placed under restraint for society's good. Anyhow, they wished us well. I hope they are all enjoying liberty now, and what is better, deserving it. Near Fort Totten, we passed President Roosevelt's naval yacht, the Mayflower, and her small gun roared out a parting salute, while the officers and men waved and cheered. Surely, no ship ever started for the end of the earth with more heart-stirring farewells than those which followed the Roosevelt. Just before we reached the Stepping Stone Light, Mrs. Perry, the members and guests of the Perry Arctic Club, and myself were transferred to the tug Narkita and returned to New York. The ship went on to Oyster Bay, Long Island, the summer home of President Roosevelt, where Mrs. Perry and I were to lunch with the President and Mrs. Roosevelt the following day. Theodore Roosevelt is to me the most intensely vital man and the biggest man 
America has ever produced. He has that vibrant energy and enthusiasm which is the basis of all real power and accomplishment. When it came to christening the ship by whose aid it was hoped to fight our way toward the most inaccessible spot on earth, the name of Roosevelt seemed to be the one and inevitable choice. It held up as ideals before the expedition those very qualities of strength, insistence, persistence, and triumph over obstacles which have made the 26th President of the United States so great. In the course of that last luncheon at Sagamore Hill, President Roosevelt reiterated what he had said to me so many times before, that he was earnestly and profoundly interested in my work, and that he believed I would succeed if success were possible. After luncheon, the President and Mrs. Roosevelt, with their three sons, came on board the ship with Mrs. Perry and me. Mr. Bridgman was on deck to welcome them in the name of the Perry Arctic Club. The Roosevelt party remained on board about an hour. The President inspected every part of the ship, shook hands with every member of the expedition present, including the crew, and even made the acquaintance of my Eskimo dogs, North Star and the others, which had been brought down from one of my islands in Casco Bay on the coast of Maine. As he was going over the rail, I said to him, Mr. President, I shall put into this effort everything there is in me, physical, mental, and moral, and he replied, I believe in you, Perry, and I believe in your success if it is within the possibility of man. The Roosevelt stopped at New Bedford for the whaleboats and also made a short stop at Eagle Island, our summer home on the coast of Maine, to take aboard the massive steel-bound spare rudder which we carried as a precaution against disaster in the coming battle royale with the ice. On the former expedition, when we had no extra rudder, we could have used two. But as things turned out this time, when we had the extra rudder, we had no occasion to use it. Our departure from Eagle Island was timed so that Mrs. Perry and I should arrive by train at Sydney, Cape Breton, the same day as the ship. I have a very tender feeling for the picturesque little town of Sydney. Eight times have I headed north from there on my Arctic quest. My recollections of the town date back to 1886 when I went there with Captain Jackman in the whaler Eagle and lay at the coal wharves for a day or two, filling the ship with coal for my very first northern voyage, the summer cruise to Greenland, during which journey the Arctic fever got a grip upon me, from which I have never recovered. Since that time, the town has grown from a little settlement of one decent hotel and a few houses to a prosperous city with 17,000 inhabitants, many industries, and one of the largest steel plants in the Western Hemisphere. My reason for choosing Sydney as a starting point was because of the coal mines there. It is the place nearest to the Arctic regions where a ship can fill with coal. My feelings on leaving Sydney this last time, though difficult to describe, were different from those at the start of any previous expedition. I felt no uneasiness once the lines were cast off, for I knew that everything had been done which could be done to ensure success and that every essential item of supplies was on board. On former journeys, I had sometimes felt anxiety, 
but through the whole of this last expedition, I allowed nothing to worry me. Perhaps this feeling of surety was because every possible contingency had been discounted. Perhaps because the setbacks and knockout blows received in the past had dulled my sense of danger. The Roosevelt having called at Sydney, we crossed the bay to North Sydney to take on some last items of supplies. When we started to leave the wharf over there, we discovered that we were aground and had to wait an hour or so for the tide to rise. In our efforts to move the ship, one of the whaleboats was crushed between the davits and the side of the pier. But after eight Arctic campaigns, one does not regard a little accident like that as a bad omen. We got away from North Sydney about half past three in the afternoon of July 17th, in glittering golden sunshine. As we passed the signal station, they signaled us goodbye and a prosperous voyage. We replied thank you and dipped our colors. A little tug which we had chartered to take our guests back to Sydney followed the Roosevelt as far as Low Point Light, outside the harbor. There she ran alongside, and Mrs. Perry and the children and Colonel Borup, with two or three other friends, transferred to her. As my five-year-old son Robert kissed me goodbye, he said, Come back soon, Dad. With reluctant eyes, I watched the little tug grow smaller and smaller in the blue distance. Another farewell, and there had been so many. Brave, noble little woman, you have borne with me the brunt of all my Arctic work. But somehow, this parting was less sad than any which had gone before. I think that we both felt it was the last. By the time the stars came out, the last items of supplies taken on at North Sydney were stowed, and the decks at least were unusually free for an Arctic ship just starting northward, all but the quarterdeck, which was piled high with bags of coal. Inside the cabins, however, all was litter and confusion. My room was filled so full of things, instruments, books, furniture, presents from friends, supplies, etc., that there was no space for me. Since my return, someone has asked me if I played on the pianola in my cabin that first day at sea. I did not, for the excellent reason that I could not get near it. The thrilling experiences of those first few hours were mainly connected with excavating a space, some six feet long by two feet broad, in the region of my bunk, where I could lay myself down to sleep when the time came. I have a special affection for my little cabin on the Roosevelt. Its size and the comfort of the bathroom adjoining were the only luxuries which I allowed myself. The cabin is plain, of matched yellow pine painted white. Its conveniences are the evolution of long experience in the Arctic regions. It has a wide built-in bunk an ordinary writing desk, several book units, a wicker chair, an office chair, and a chest of drawers. These latter items of furniture being Mrs. Perry's contributions to my comfort. Hanging over the pianola was a photograph of Mr. Jessup, and on the side wall was one of President Roosevelt, autographed. Then there were the flags, 
the silk one made by Mrs. Perry, which I had carried for years, the flag of my college fraternity, Delta Kappa Epsilon, the flag of the Navy League, and the peace flag of the Daughters of the American Revolution. There is also a photograph of our home on Eagle Island and a fragrant pillow made by my daughter Marie from the pine needles of that island. The pianola, a gift from my friend H. H. Benedict, had been my pleasant companion on my previous voyage, and again on this it proved one of our greatest sources of pleasure. There were at least 200 pieces of music in my collection, but the strains of Faust rolled out over the Arctic Ocean more often than any other. Marches and songs were also popular, with the Blue Danube waltz, and sometimes when the spirits of my party were at rather a low ebb, we had ragtime pieces which they especially enjoyed. There was also in my cabin a fairly complete Arctic library, absolutely complete in regard to all later voyages. These books, with a large assortment of novels and magazines, could be depended upon to relieve the tedium of the long Arctic night, and very useful they were found for that purpose. Sitting up late at night means something when the night is some months long. On the second day out, the carpenter began the repairs on the crushed whale boat, using lumber which we carried for such purposes. The sea was rough, and the waste of the ship was awash nearly all day my companions were gradually getting settled in their cabins, and if any man had qualms of homesickness, he kept them to himself. Our living quarters were in the after-deck house, which extends the full width of the Roosevelt, from a little aft of the mainmast to the mizzenmast. In the center is the engine room, with the skylight and the uptake from the boilers, and on either side are the cabins and the mess rooms. My own cabin occupied the starboard corner aft. Forward from this was Henson's room, the starboard mess room, and in the forward starboard corner, Surgeon Goodsell's room. On the port side aft was Captain Bartlett's room, occupied by himself and Marvin, and forward from this in succession, the cabin of the chief engineer and his assistant, the cabin of Percy the steward, and the cabin of Macmillan and Borup. Then the mate and the boatswain were in the forward port corner of the deckhouse, next to the port mess room of the junior officers. The starboard mess comprised Bartlett, Dr. Goodsell, Marvin, Macmillan, Borup, and myself. I shall not dwell at great length upon the first stage of the journey from Sydney to Cape York, Greenland, for the reason that it is only a pleasant summer cruise at that season of the year, such as any fair-sized yacht may undertake without peril or adventure, and there are more interesting and unusual things to write about. In passing through the Straits of Belle Isle, the graveyard of ships, where there is always danger of encountering icebergs in the fog or being swung upon the shore by the strong and capricious currents, I remained up all night, as any man would, who had care for his ship. But I could not help contrasting that easy summer passage with our return in November 1906, when the Roosevelt was standing on end half the time, and the rest of the time was rolling the rail under water, 
losing two rudders, being smashed by the sea, creeping along the Labrador coast in the berg season through dense fog, and picking up Point Amour light only when within a stone's throw of the shore, guided only by the sirens at Point Amour and Bald Head and the whistles of the big steamships lying at the entrance of the strait, afraid to attempt the passage. And with that, I think we'll end this evening's reading from the North Pole by Robert E. Perry. I am really enjoying this narrative of his adventure, and it proves completely that the only boring thing about this podcast is your reader. I find all of these books fascinating, and even though I hope they relax you and help you go to sleep, I hope you enjoy them as well. If you'd like to read this book for yourself, and see the photographs it contains of the expedition. As always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect, or suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, the best place to catch me is on Twitter at Boring Books Pod. I always love hearing from you. I'm so glad you could join me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night.